you would, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, as we continue our study in the book of Acts, the history of the early, early church. Acts chapter 9, once you find your place in Acts 9, I invite you to stand as we honor God with the reading of his word. Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any, any in this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many, th many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy servants at Jerusalem. And here... He hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias, and Ananias went his way and entreated into the house and putting his hands on him said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that uh, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, as we are to the teaching and preaching part of the service, Father, I ask once again that you would empty me of myself. Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin. That you would fill me with thine Holy Spirit that I may preach thus saith the word of the Lord. Father, as we discuss Saul's conversion, Lord, help us this morning. May you enlighten our eyes, our minds, our heart this morning. 
or that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit would be enabled to do His work in every heart and every life this morning that is here. Father, as we discuss these verses, I ask that you would help us to be focused, that you would help us to be engaged in the message. Father, that you would bless the message, that you would meet with us this morning. Father, for it may be this morning that there's someone here or that they're not sure if you were to take their life today, that heaven would be their home. Father, if there be anyone this morning not sure if they're saved, or that they may know that they're not saved, Father, that they would not delay any further, that they had received, that they had placed their faith and their trust in Jesus alone for their salvation. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for what you are going to do in every heart and in every life this morning. Father, may we give you full attention that you can have your will and your way. Father, I ask you to do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. Saul's conversion. So we're speaking about this morning. There are some things in here I want us to see. Most of us know about this, what happened to Saul here on the Damascus Road. Saul recounts this, his conversion in Acts 22 and also in Acts 26. Where he's recounting what had happened to him. Uh, on this road, and I would encourage you, read chapters 22 and 26, because Paul goes into detail, more detail in t chapters 22 and 26 than what Luke here records for us uh, in chapter 9 about Paul's conversion. And we know that Paul, he has zeal for the Lord, for God, doesn't he? He has zeal for God. Of course, he was trained under Gamaliel, the, the a Pharisee, and he himself, uh, he calls himself a, he calls himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. He listen. He has zeal unto God, but not uh, with knowledge. This guy he grew up, uh, of course, a, a Jew, and was uh, excited about his religion of Judaism. And listen, he was sure that these believers, which he called disciples, that's what Paul called them, the disciples, right? Because that's what he mentions here in chapter 9, uh, and that, uh, that they were wrong and that he, they're lying about who Jesus is and that they uh, are on the wrong side of things. And so he is excited about uh, serving God and trying to do away with the deci these disciples uh, of Christ, and so much so that he himself was consulting or approving of Stephen's death. So much so that he held the garments of those that they found witnesses, false witnesses against Stephen, to stone him. And if you read in chapters 22 and 26, you will see that in those chapters he also mentions Stephen by name of what he was doing. And so Saul, in, on, in chapter 9, he's continued to threat. If we look in verse number 1, he says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and what? So you know what that means, right? It means murder. That Saul, with his zeal for God was threatening the church, the, the disciples. What was he threatening? Murder. He was, tell, he was threatening that he wanted to kill them. And so and, and we see that Paul has a destination here. He's wanting to go to 
Damascus. So number one, Paul's destination, he's, he's wanting to, to go to Damascus, and not only is he wanting to go to Damascus, he's so zealous for God that he goes to the high priest and wants official papers that he can take and to the synagogues there in Damascus and say, and if he finds anyone in this way, talking about anyone that, any disciples that believe on Jesus as the, as the Son of God, as the Savior, that he can grab them and t- bring them back to Jerusalem. Why? Where he can murder and throw them in jail. So uh, this is where we are uh, in, in the life of the church, of the early church in the history of Saul. He was determined to persecute the church, to persecute the disciples. Wanted permission, papers, official papers to take with him to Damascus. You see, Paul didn't discriminate. He goes, I want to take, whether if it doesn't matter if it's men or women, if there's anybody, anyone, that I find in this way, that's what he says, that I can bring them bound back to Jerusalem. Paul was on a, was on a mission, wasn't he? He thought he was doing God's work. Now think about this. After everything that he has heard and he has seen, everything that he has seen with the miracles that has happened and everything that he has heard that there would every, uh, those that he had run into that he was try, that he was persecuting would not recant Jesus after everything he had saw and everything he had heard he was still yet determined to persecute the church it's crazy to me that Saul after what he has heard and he had seen Still, deter- had that. Still, was determined to do these things, and I'm like, it, it amazes me. But then that's that's the that that's the heart and the mind of a lost man. Saul was lost. Saul was on his way to hell, was he not? He was. And it reminds me of folks today. There are folks that grow up in church and attend church for years who hear the gospel message and still will not submit the truth of Jesus Christ. That's sad. Folks, there are churches all across our land that are filled with people playing church. They come to church because they think that's what they're supposed to do. They come to church because, well... Mom and dad made them to do that, and they, and they think, well, if I go to church, that's, listen, that's what's going to set me apart. I, God's going to bless me because I'm going to church. Yet they hear week in and week out the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and they still are determined not to submit themselves to the Lord and place their faith totally in Christ. So Paul, determined to persecute the church, goes and sets out for Damascus. Second thing we see in these verses, there's a, Saul has a confrontation. And as he, verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Saul here is confronted by God. Actually, he's confronted by Jesus. Jesus is God, right? I want you to turn to Acts chapter 22 real quick. 
And look how Paul de- described when he turned when he's when we call him Paul in Acts twenty two. Look at uh, Acts chapter twenty two. And look at uh, verse number twelve. As he's describing, as he's giving his testimony, and he's when he's arising, he goes in verse uh, twelve and one in an eye, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him, and he said, the God and he said. The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see and see that, what? What's that next two words? Just one. That just one, and should hear the voice of the mouth. So Saul here, at midday, he sees the glory of Jesus Christ, which is brighter than the sun that is, that is described. He tells it, and the way he describes it in, in, in chapters 22 and also in chapters 26, he says, this, this bright light that I saw on the Damascus Road, it, at midday it was brighter than even the sun. And, and, and so in, in chapters 22, Saul says, I saw the just one. Not only did I see the just one, I heard his what? Voice. So here in chapter 9, is we see the confrontation that Saul has on his way to Damascus. Saul sees the Lord, sees the glory of Jesus. And what had happened? I fell to the earth. He fell on his hands and knees. I, I know a lot of us know the song that um, it was mercy me or whatever they put out when I see you what will I do will I stand up will I sing hallelujah or will I fall on my knees I think we get a just of when we see Jesus in heaven what we're going to do because what did the glory of Jesus do to Saul fell to the earth on his hands and knees Paul Saul, the Apostle Paul, now what we hear in chapter 9 is Saul saw the glory of Jesus and heard his voice. And he fell on his hands and knees to the earth. And And Jesus asked him a question, why are you persecuting me? Why would Jesus, who's already in heaven, right on the right hand of God, asking Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, folks, what are we? We are the body of Christ, aren't we? So Saul, when he's persecuting the disciples, who's he persecuting? Jesus, this is one of the reasons why God was dealing with me to treat folks like Jesus treat. Uh, God treats them because of the body of Christ. And sometimes we don't realize that, do we? If, if, if I'm talking to Brother Jason, I need a, he's part of the body of Christ. Right? And so uh, Jesus asked Saul, why are you persecuting me? He hears the voice, sees the glory of Jesus and hears his voice. Why are you persecuting me? At this moment, at this very moment, Saul realizes who Jesus is. He is enlightened. He understands that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord, because that word Lord that Paul that Saul uses, that word Lord in the Greek means given to God, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. And so 
He's give, he, he's calling Jesus Lord. And so what does Saul do? Well, he's humbled. And he submits to the Lord. And trembling and astonished, verse number 6 said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? So he, he, he asked Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. For those of you who don't know, a prick is a modern-day cattle prod. Back in the day, they would use a long pole with a sharp end, and they would the farmer, who whatever he was doing, that was pulling the cart or whatever, he would use this long prod, what we call a cattle prod now, we use electricity, right, to get, to get a cow or a cattle to go where we want them to go. Well, they would use this long, sharp pole to direct the ox or the cattle, or wherever, whatever was pulling the cart, which way that the farmer wanted them to go. Because if he did, the, the animal didn't obey his voice or with the reins, he would use his pole to direct that animal. Jesus is telling Paul, Saul here, you can't stop the church. Because Jesus is the one that's directing it. Jesus is the one that's building it, right? He goes, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And if an animal were to kick against that pro, it'd hurt him. And so Saul, he realizes uh, who Jesus is, calls him Lord and submits to him and says, What do you want me to do? That is the attitude of every single person. It is to be the attitude of every single person Every single saved person. Lord, what do you want me to do? And so he submits to Jesus. What do you want me to do? He finds out that he's been fighting the Lord. The Lord's going to put him in the direction he wants him to go. Trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Paul's converted. He realizes that Jesus is the Son of God. Realizes that Jesus is the Savior, that he is the Messiah. We see that conversion here in these, in these verses. Saul got saved right here on the road. Asked him what he's to do. So what happens? Jesus tells him to continue to go to Damascus. And so Saul goes to Damascus. At the beginning, we saw that in verse number 1 that Paul was prideful, wanting to go to Damascus in his pride with papers to persecute the disciples of Christ. How does Paul come to Damascus? Humbled. He comes humbled. That he's coming, he's having to be led by the men that was with him on his way to Damascus because he couldn't see, right? And so he's, and he's, he comes into Damascus humbled, having to be led by the men that was with him. Those men that were with him, they, they, when they saw what was going on and uh, they, they uh, heard the voice, but they didn't see any, anyone. Verse 7, and these men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. Saul rose from the earth and went, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. What happens? 
Well, he speaks to a Damascus. We're going to get into more of this next week, but he gets, he, he, the Lord speaks to uh, Ananias, a disciple, to go and to, do, to lay hands on him and to, so Paul can, Saul can see. So think about this. Think, think about the, look what the Lord has him do. He says, go to Damascus. So he goes to Damascus, and in verse number 9 says he's there three days, and while he's there, and he can't see, he's not eating, nor is he drinking anything. And the Lord goes to, uh, speaks to Ananias and says, I want you to go to Saul, uh, is from, uh, Saul of Tarsus and to do this, and Ananias is like, uh, time out, Lord. He has papers. I heard he has papers to uh, arrest me. And the Lord says, no, just go. Because he's seen the vision of you coming. And, Ani and of course, Ananias goes. And Saul, uh, Damascus, there are three days not eating and drinking because everything that has happened with his interaction with Jesus he was so focused with what his interaction with Jesus that he didn't want to eat nor drink anything for three days. And the question I want to ask us this morning, as we discuss these, as we've discussed these verses this morning, are you kicking against the pricks? Those of you who are saved this morning. The Lord's trying to direct you into an area in your life that He wants you to, wants you to do, or wants something that He's wanting you, where you, He's wanting to send you, or wanting you to do, and and you're not submitting. Instead, you're kicking against where He's trying to direct you. I've seen a lot of videos where horses and other things are right, and they just kick. I saw one horse kick another horse's one thing and killed the horse like that. Are you kicking against Jesus? And no, I want to do this. No, I, that, I, listen, this is more fun. No, Lord, that, Lord, that's too hard. Are you kicking against the pricks this morning? Not submitting to G not submitting to your Lord and Savior. You know, Lord, that, that I don't want to do that. that. That's too hard, or I don't want to go there. This is more fun. I, you know, the, I'm more comfortable in this area and doing this in my life than what you're asking me to do, or what you're telling me or commanding me to do. And so, I'm going to kick. Or are you one? Or are you a person this morning that's you realize you're under the conviction uh, of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is convicting your heart, and you know that you're not saved, and you're just delaying it. You 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 you, you might be saying, "Not right now." Not right now. I, I'm not ready. Well, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You better get ready. It's only by the grace of God that you do make it to tomorrow. Because listen, could, could not Jesus have struck him dead there on the Damascus road? He saw the glory of Jesus, didn't he? Jesus could have struck him dead right there on the Damascus road, but he showed him grace. And it's only by the grace of God that when you, as you continue to reject Jesus, or you continue to neglect the, uh, uh, putting, placing all your faith and your trust in Jesus alone, it's only by the grace of God that you're continuing to live today. By the way, it's only by the grace of God that we continue, as saved folks, to continue. Are you saying not right now? I'm young. I still have a life to live. I, I want to. 
do this and I want to do that. Folks, have you not seen in the last two weeks all the Amber Alerts? We, we're not guaranteed to make it home. You're not guaranteed to make it to school tomorrow. You're not guaranteed to make it to work tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed. Are you kicking against the pricks this morning? You're telling Jesus that not right now. You you wanted you you have plans. What I have plans, Jesus. I have plans to do this and do that. Listen, I'm about to go to college, or I'm getting ready to go to college, or it's my senior year, and uh, you, you know how much fun I'm supposed to have my senior year. It's my last really fun time. You kicking against the pricks this morning, or have you been doing that here lately? Jesus says it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Why? Because when you kick, let me help you. You're not hurting him. You're hurting yourself. You're hurt, not hurting the farmer. The animal's not hurting the farmer. The animal's hurting himself when he kicks. The more you say no, the more damage you're doing to yourself. The more you say no to Jesus, whether it's placing your faith and your trust in him for salvation or whether you're telling him no because he's trying to direct your path, he's trying to get you to grow in, in, the, in, in your knowledge in him and to grow in your faith and to submit to him in certain areas of your life, the more you say no, the more you're going to hurt yourself. The more you're going to find yourself in this chaos or in that chaos, your life will be in shambles because you are saying no and you're saved this morning. I have seen folks who are disobedient to the Lord, who wreck their family, who wreck their life. In the last couple of years, I have seen a man who was serving God, happily married, had his family serving God, happily married. What does he do? Gets out of the ministry. He gets out of the ministry because his children have come to him, said that they don't want to do this anymore. He gets out of the he gets out of the ministry because he wants to save his family, but save his not his children because he he doesn't want to lose his children. Gets out of the ministry, and with two years he's divorced. Living, in a, living with another female, his mind, his life is wrecked. He's constantly in chaos. Well, I ha actually, uh, well, about a year and a half ago, put himself into a psychiatric clinic for I don't remember how many months. When you say no to the Lord... When you disobey the Lord and you're saved, there is a price to pay. You will hurt yourself. Because the Lord knows what's right for you. He's wanting to guide and direct your life. And let me help you, let me help you out. No, the Lord never, does not intend for us to lose our family in divorce. Divorce is not the will of God. Bible. It's what Jesus told the Pharisees. Because it was their hardness of their heart that Moses did this. Folks, you and I all know families who have wrecked their life because they said no. They wouldn't submit or whether the, to the Lord that are saved, and then you have no and then there we all know folks who need to be sa who need to be saved and who say no. Listen, don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. Saul was the most unlikely candidate to be saved. Was he not? 
He was the most unlikely candidate to be saved. He was the most unlikely man to be saved by Jesus because he had papers, well, had zeal to God to, to kill and to, to, to imprison the d- disciples of Christ, and yet G- Jesus confronts him. And he gets saved on the Damascus Road. There are folks that we, can, that we see, they'll never get saved. Look at their life. Don't give up on them. Continue to confront them with Jesus and love. Continue to confront them in Jesus and love. Be that testimony. Be that testimony. Remember, they're not your enemy. Your enemy is spiritual, it's Satan. Are you kicking against the pricks this morning and refusing to submit to the Lord and placing your faith and your trust in him for, to be saved? Are you kicking against the pricks this morning and refusing to submit unto the Lord with your life? Folks, it's a choice you have to make. It's a choice you have to make. So you being saved is a choice you make by placing your faith, your trust in Christ alone. Turning from yourself, your sin, and turning to Christ. That's what repenting is. Repenting from yourself, your sin, and turning to Christ. That is a choice you have to make. And it's a choice you have to make whether you submit to Jesus as your Lord and repent from whatever uh, disobedience you're doing right now and, and, and turning back to Jesus and putting your focus back onto the Lord. It is your choice. Are you kicking against the pricks this morning? I'm going to pray here in just a second. And if you're not saved this morning, if you know that if you were to die today that heaven would not be your home, I'm going to pray for you. I will pray for you. And if you're saved this morning and you're just, you, you have no desire to submit to Jesus' as lordship of your life and you're only giving him a very small portion of your life and you continue to kick against the pricks and say, no, I'm going to pray for you too. One, that you'd come to the altar and that you would do business with him and submit and surrender to the Lord of your life. And if you're not saved this morning, I'm going to pray that you place your faith and your trust in him this morning. Because it is hard to kick against the pricks. Father.